yeah thank you so much um and i'm sorry if it looks like i have a halo on top of my head or you know like there's light coming out of my spectacles i don't know how it looks right there right now but um i just have my extremely awesome lighting to blame today um the weather's really really bad out here so i've had to put in all the extra light normally it's just uh, uh you know the sunlight that i rely on but the extra lighting is causing all this havoc but um we're going to talk about uh, the um the impact that influencer economies especially tech influencers have on the open source ecosystem today and we're going to do that in the context of the gold rush phenomenon now a lot of you all might not know about the gold rush phenomenon so we're going to go very briefly into what it is in a couple of minutes but before that i think i owe you all all an introduction from my side so i'm divya mohan and uh, <clears throat> i'm an open source contributor and maintainer and also an uh, advocate at my day job <laughs> uh, with susa but before i made my way into uh, the open source ecosystem i was a systems engineer and thereafter a people manager and for those of you all who wonder what i do outside of my open source work and if i actually do have a life out, out of open source i do and it's taking care of uh, two uh, really cute kittens and uh, i serve my feline overlords uh, pretty much every day and everything that i do is pretty much for uh, them uh, and today is unfortunately not going to be the day where you hear more about them or me but uh, you're going to learn about uh, the impact uh, the tech influencers and the influencer economies have on uh, the open source ecosystem so we're going to do that in the context of the gold rush phenomenon but before that what is a gold rush um i'm not sure if uh, any of you are taylor swift fans in the house uh, it doesn't it's not related to her song but the idea did come from that song and uh, essentially a gold rush or gold fever is um, the on rush or influx of uh, businesses miners and uh, people in general into the region where uh, gold precious earth metals and rare earth minerals were discovered um, as you know um, deposits around two centuries ago and um, if you were to uh, ask me what it looked like when we were doing all these efforts and undertaking all these efforts that's that's what it looked like there was extensive hydraulic mining efforts they uh, there was obviously a lot of profitability involved um, a lot of economic development for the regions transport routes were developed so all in all a great great um, thing you'd assume but not really because uh, there were long lasting effects that sort of came along with it as well now what were those long lasting effects because of the mining efforts that were undertaken and because of the way um, these efforts were carried out there was a lot of waste generated and uh, given the efficiency of the tools and given the efficiency of the um, you know techniques that we were using there was a lot of waste generated and since we didn't know what to do with them a lot of it was dumped into local water bodies and there was contamination that's the first part the second part is that uh, to undertake all these mining efforts you had to completely revamp um, or you know lay to waste a lot of uh, existing ecosystems like forests and wetlands and um endanger the existing uh, flora and fauna in these ecosystems so that was one of the negative side effects and uh, these side effects continue to persist even today um the health hazards the public safety hazards that uh, are remnants of an era long gone by still persist today and are recorded as liabilities for the government who um you know govern these regions and um, all of this is data that i have um, taken from the public archives of the us government 
I uh, know for a fact that this was not just US specific, but the data available was only for that specific region. So I've taken that data, but this is the case wherever this phenomenon was observed across the world, uh, whether it be in US, whether it be in Australia, whether it be in the African continent, etc. So uh, why are we talking about the gold rush today? And how does this relate to open source? Because mining and software, unless you're talking about crypto mining, don't have like a lot of things in common. How does this all relate to open source? And how does it relate to technology? Now, when you talk about open source numbers in the past couple of years, this was data from 2019, by the way. And if you're talking about numbers, the open source ecosystem has seen a humongous spike in the numbers of projects that have, um, you know, started cropping up as open source software and open source hardware on GitHub and otherwise, right? But um, what about the contributor numbers? Are they increasing? Um, I would say they are because uh, the state of Octoverse report um, for 2023, that is last year, stated that 2023 saw the largest number of first time contributors ever in the history of open source. Now, um, open source by far is not a new phenomenon by any means. Uh, it's probably as old as I am or slightly older, give or take a decade. But uh, it's not by any means something that has just come up uh, in the past couple of years. And, you know, people are starting to get interested in it in an increasing number. So why is this happening right now? Why are people um, who are first time open source contributors gaining that uh, sort of interest? And why is the movement gaining this traction? First up, I uh, want to introduce you to our trifecta out of which we'll be covering one in a lot of depth today, which is the influencer marketing um, uh, section. The trifecta comprises of the internet, which is, of course, the um, greatest equalizer after death and health, probably, uh, because literally every everybody who has a mobile device or even a very old laptop or desktop has access to the information as someone with a very sophisticated laptop. So I would call that the great equalizer when it comes to information. But the Internet was not as um widespread in access um and you know countries uh, based in asia africa and some other parts really did not have access to the um, internet in the way they do right now like the remote areas they they are um they are just getting on board so internet access has become cheaper has become ubiquitous in the past decade uh, additionally um Along with this, uh, you know, widespread nature of inter uh, internet access over the last couple of years, what has happened is there has also been this trend of viral marketing, aka word of mouse. Now, what is word of mouse? Um, for those who do not um, read Seth Gordon, y'all should definitely read his blog about the word of mouse. It's just a couple of lines explaining what it is. But essentially, it boils down to the fact that um, traditional marketing efforts are not really helpful when you're talking about Internet marketing. Uh, internet marketing relies on uh, network effects to go um, viral and to reach the audience that it actually has to reach um, via various methods like SEO, etc. So um, this trend actually came into being only after the internet has, um, you know, sort of uh, crossed its infancy into its toddler stage, right around 2000, where Hotmail.com, if anybody is there who's as old as I am, to remember how that felt like creating your first um, account on Hotmail. Um, Hotmail was one of the first proponents of this marketing. Um, and it's a trend that's carried even today. For example, what Hotmail did with uh, in this viral marketing bit 
was uh, just to append a single line at the end of every message that goes out from its email uh, provider. And uh, today, it does not seem like a good uh, big thing or something that's so grand. But think back to the early days of the internet where um, internet access was not that ubiquitous. It was not that uh, common to have uh, access at home. Uh, a lot of us used to go to uh, cyber cafes and um, used to go to these very uh, niche places to actually access internet. So having an email account, having like access to um, a MySpace or an AOL was huge. So signaling that was the way uh, to your network that, hey, you were cool. And Hotmail sort of relied on this because honestly speaking, it did not have a lot of marketing budget back then. Uh, it had a measly $50,000 to start with. But what this signaling did in the early days of the internet is remarkable. Uh, it not only uh, got Hotmail around 1.8 million signups um, by the end of the year, but uh, it also made it very, very um, trendy. So much so that uh, Microsoft eventually ended up buying Hotmail, if, again, anybody here remembers. Um, and that is the uh, superset of influencer marketing, which we're going to delve in today. Because um, influencer marketing is the subset of what we know, know as viral marketing, but it's tied to a very specific individual or set of individuals who are known as tech influencers. And uh, who can be called as an influencer really? Are you an influencer? Am I an influencer? Um, how many number, uh, what are the numbers that it takes to make an influencer, um, you know, worthy of being called one? So influencers are defined as people who um, are uh, having a large network of followers, irrespective of the platform, really. And uh, they are regarded as trusted tastemakers in one or several niches. Now, um, there has to be a distinction made at this point between tastemakers and between um, subject matter experts, because Sometimes there is an overlap between a tastemaker and a subject matter expert, but more often than not, the subject matter expert does not really have the time and the bandwidth to become a tastemaker. So tastemakers are essentially curators and creators of content, while subject matter experts are experts in the subject that's being talked about. So, um, the tastemaker or, you know, the influencer um, the, that is categorized as a tastemaker can actually talk about it at a very shallow level. But the subject matter expert can go deep and can tell you about the intricacies of the product or the brand that they are selling to you or they're trying to sell to you. So uh, when I talk about these tastemakers or, um, you know, influencers who are tastemakers, what is it that they achieve? Now, um, influencers are there to influence you. They're not there to market to you. They're not there to sell to you. So what they essentially achieve is a connection with you. And via them, the brand achieves the connection. Now, this is not something um, that's unknown. A lot of us are influenced by uh, influencers in various spheres of our life. And um, it's basically the establishment of a very uh, personable um, and persuasive person uh, as your, uh, you know, hinge between the company that's backing this person and the person, uh, people who are buying from this person, that is the audience. And um, it's actually, if you look at it, and if you think about it, it's a good value proposition for all these three folks, whether you're talking about uh, you know, the user who's getting to buy the product, whether you're talking about the person in between who's endorsing it or you're talking about the company. It's a it seems to be a win win situation. But um, unfortunately, uh, I don't really think that's the case, because when it comes to open source today, there are a number of influencers and and. By number, I mean there's like a huge, huge number of influencers and um, uh, subject matter experts who are influencers. So 
where do we draw the line and what is it like today when you do a quick google search today this is what the first page looks like and this is the first page when i search um how do i get started with open source now this is not a throw shade at anybody uh, mind you this whole presentation is not a throw shade at any person or any brand or any product this is just to show you the reality of where we are and what we need to do better this is what it looks like and everybody has a different opinion everybody is backed by a different uh, company everybody is being sponsored for their videos by different companies and what ends up happening is that um, you know there are very segmented opinions and um, sometimes the bad opinion gets through and by bad i don't necessarily be bad in intention but it just signals a very bad position for the entire ecosystem to be in like what happened with october fest 2020 um so if uh, anybody was um, participating or does remember what happened in october fest 2020 um there was a very mundane video that went out it was not even um a video by uh an influencer with the number of followers that we associate with youtube stars or influencers today the the person maybe had like a four thousand five thousand people reach and he put out a video stating that um you know just contribute to open source and you know you'll get uh, this free swag just like literally just put a uh, pull in uh, just put in a pull request against any of the repositories that are marked open source and you'll get the swag and um this is not necessarily a problem uh because when you look at the message uh that person might have wanted the uh, larger public to contribute to open source but the way he put it across was like hey you get free stuff go here and that sort of created a horrible 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 ripple effect this was the website uh, repository for the kubernetes project back in that um you know month so hacktober fest essentially takes place in october it's an online virtual fest where digital ocean um, lists some projects you can contribute to and your um you know free to contribute to them and if you have four pull requests or a certain number you're given a free t-shirt um this was what k website looked like in october 2020 and mind you we were not even participants in uh the hacktober fest and every year after that we receive uh, these pull requests in a low, lower number but that that year it was a lot and this is not even the entire set that we received and uh, when we talk about people who were affected open source projects who were affected it was not just the kubernetes project or some of the other projects that i worked with every literal uh, open source project that i know of ha was affected and people took to twitter or to other social media platforms to actually went about it um there there are several articles about this um some of which have linked in the resources section and um, it subsequently got worse um and you think it would not happen you think that the situation could not get worse but um from this what a lot of people gathered was that hey github's the greatest place that you could actually um you know contribute to open source why not gamify the whole process and um why not like endorse open source system uh, uh open source ecosystem as a great place for uh people to earn a quick buck now i have nothing against people earning money i don't have anything against people learning in public but the amount of videos and amount of uh, content that gets churned out even today um because of the lack of some consolidated content coming in from people who work within these projects is humongous like this these screenshots just for the sake of relevance was taken yesterday um it could have been i could have filled way more slides but i decided to spare y'all <laughs> and uh, when we talk about github gamification that went on another level uh github 
uh, when I started out at least uh, 11 years back, uh, yes, it was a thing which was great if you knew the basics of Git and if you knew version control um, earlier on, but it was something that was not so popular. Uh, it was not something that um, was a must have when you submitted your resume. But um, I'm frequently hearing from people who are looking for jobs these days, and I've myself been on the um, you know, look out uh, two years earlier when I was switching jobs and um, GitHub comes across like GitHub contributions and contributions to open source comes across as a prominent requirement. And I think that gave rise to even worse situations because now people gamify the whole process of getting those green squares highlighted on GitHub with like extensive black markets selling you those um, tools. But there are also free ones available. Um, the ones that are available on the black market, they date you back to the start of your GitHub contribution journey just so you can fill up all of the previous um, you know, years with some data and populate it with contributions. But even the ones that are available do a pretty good job. So you must be wondering now, isn't all of this like good in terms of like people are coming in, uh, people are, uh, you know, uh, contributing to projects. There's more attention on projects. Isn't this all supposed to be good in terms of like awareness and uh, for the sake of people doing business in open source? Not quite. Um, the reason being uh, now even the success of open source projects is actually calculated by the number of forks, clones, and stars that are there on a GitHub project. Venture capital um, uh, investors have actually come out and expli explicitly stated that the first thing that they look at is GitHub stars when they look at the growth or um, you know success of an open source project and. Unfortunately, GitHub stars does nothing when it comes to uh, quantifying the amount of interest or adoption that an open source project has. You could literally gamify the number of stars that a, a project has by asking people to subscribe and get a gift. Um, you could do that by purchasing stars off of GitHub uh, black market uh, black markets available for this as well. There are bots that do this every um, for very low prices going down to I think six euros or 10 euros for around 100 or 150 stars. So things are getting a little difficult to handle when you talk about it from a business perspective because you don't know how to quantify it. and um, when you talk about asking people to actually evangelize, what do you ask them to evangelize about? Do you ask them to evangelize about your project, your product? Um, what do you give as the call to action? That all actually did not, you know, turn out well for our ecosystem because now it's all gamified. And um, you must assume at this point that um, Okay, fine. I mean, the GitHub stars are an issue. People are gamifying getting into open source, but at least people are still contributing. Uh, so, I mean, this must mean well for open source, right? At least the projects that they're contributing to. But apparently not, because the bus factor for most open source projects that are popular across GitHub uh, is less than two. Now, for those of you who do not know what a bus factor means, uh, there are two ways to actually think about it. Um, the first way is um, how many people in the project need to get hit by a bus? Unfortunately, very tragic to think about it, but how many people in the project need to get hit by a bus till that project goes unmaintained? And imagine if that number is less than 2% um, for your project. Imagine how unsus unsustainable it is when less than 2% of your entire contributor base needs to be hit in order for that project to go unmaintained. And um, it's not that maintainers aren't trying. Uh, from personal experience, I know that um, we've been actively trying uh, 
in whatever capacity we can to make the ecosystem a more welcoming place, to make the ecosystem uh, more friendly for newer contributors and uh, to ensure the growth of those contributors across the ladder. But um, sometimes it's just not enough. You see, um, things just don't pan out the way we want to because we're also humans and maintainer burnout is a very real thing. Imagine having to do advocacy of the project that you're working with on top of the day job and on top of the maintainership that you do during your um, personal, uh, personal hours outside of work. It becomes a little too much at times. And uh, that's why we need to think about how we can actually fix this. So there are three pillars that I believe will actually alleviate this problem or at least minimize the effects of the problem that we have right now. The first pillar that I'm going to be talk or talking about is the communication pillar. So we are clearly uh, not doing very well when it comes to advocating and messaging um, about the projects that we work with. Uh, and that's because we don't know what we are talking about. Um, we don't know what we want to highlight to a user because we do not have an idea of what we want to measure when we talk to a user. Uh, are they interested in X or Y or Z? Uh, what are the indicators by which you would measure that interaction? We don't have that yet. We measure them on cosmetic metrics and we measure the output that comes from those interactions, but we neither measure the process nor the outcome, whether that output actually does lead to uh, an eventual adoption or not. So that has to be formalized. That needs to be streamlined. That, that needs to be adopted across the board. And for that sake, there are projects like Chaos that are working uh, to form metrics around community building and health. And uh, for the purpose of this presentation and outside of it, this is something I'm absolutely passionate about. And I just opened this um, issue a while back uh, for, uh, you know, formalizing a model or a metric around the advocacy and open source initiatives within a project. So if this is something you would like to chip into, uh, the Chaos project is absolutely open source and it's something you should definitely consider contributing to if, um, and this issue is something you should consider chiming on if it's something you're interested in too. But uh, this is about the communication pillar. But uh, just addressing our communication won't do a lot because as we're seeing a lot of people from various parts of the globe are joining in. Uh, it's not just the West anymore that's interested in open source. It's uh, people from Asia, people from Africa are also trickling into open source. And we need to ensure that uh, we are able to welcome these people and we are able to onboard them in a very uh, proper manner for which we need better DEI initiatives and metrics around them. Again, chaos is doing a great job, but I think different perspectives are still required when it comes to how we can nurture and grow the mentorship programs such as Outreachy, Summer of Code, uh, Season of Dogs, etc. Um, and pair mentoring is something I cannot rec recommend enough. When I was a contributor and um, I was looking for my next thing, um, a maintainer actually, uh, you know, agreed to uh, help me uh, go up the ladder with the help of a pair mentoring cohort. And uh, this was extremely helpful because people actually tell you and guide you around this and for that maintainers also need to have time which we shall come to in the next section but that is an absolute game changer when it comes to onboarding newer contributors on and helping them rise up the ladder and for all of this we need to have dei as the primary um citizen in a project i know it's a very uh, commonly abused term nowadays you hear a lot about dei initiative but we need to go beyond woke washing and we need to actually start thinking of DEI as a first citizen and enforcing those rules in um, all areas of our project. And lastly, I want to talk about the maintainer pillar because I'm a maintainer and I really, really hope that um, we do not let this become the standard, this XKCD comic become the standard for what our projects look like eventually. 
because um, a lot of us would like to move on. A lot of us would like to devise succession plans, but how do we do all of that uh, when we do not have the time um, or we are worried about our next uh, meal or when we do not get paid for the project? Now, I'm very lucky that I work um, during my office hours for the project, but it's not necessarily the case across the board. So we need to make open source contributions more viable for maintainers so that they actually have time to not only work on maintaining projects, but also to advocate for these projects. Um, even though it's an extra thing on their plate, they're very interested. Like I'm 100%, I know that a lot of um, us are interested in bringing on our successors and mentoring them, but we don't simply get the time and we need to actually build uh, an environment where this is possible. Otherwise, what happened with the gold rush, uh, I hope you all folks remember because that was a long time back. We're going to um, put to waste an entire ecosystem that's thriving. The, the open source ecosystem might live on after this has gone by because we have adoption. We have a lot of other things going on for us, but it's not going to be the same. There's going to be a lot of potential wasted if we do not figure out how to advocate and communicate our requirements right now and we do not advocate uh, and communicate our projects to the right audience. Uh, so that's about it, I think. Um, and uh, these are the resources that I have used for the project. Unfortunately, uh, somehow my slide is hanging here, but um, I had a whole bunch of places where you could find me um, on GitHub, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Uh, but that's pretty much it from my side regarding the presentation. If you all have any questions, I'd be happy to take them now. Please.